Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the early show. I'm Jeff Adolson, and I'm a restoration specialist with the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office. And I'm going to talk to you today about the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation and, Rehabil and the Guidelines for Rehabilitating Historic Buildings. I'm going to tell you what the standards and the guidelines are. I'm going to show you several examples, most of which are Rosenwald schools, where projects have met the standards, where they haven't met the standards. And in the latter category, it's really not because people were trying to meet the standards. I think most of the examples that are really bad examples are examples that happened years ago and folks didn't know that they had a historic building. So I'm just using them for, to illustrate the point. Um, I will end up with a couple photographs at Panther Branch for those of you who went out there yesterday to show you the work that's going on there. So the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, the rehabilitation is one of four basic treatments. But there are four basic treatments to historic properties. You have preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and, and uh, reconstruction. And preservation is basically doing a minimal amount of work. It's targeting a certain project and trying to get that done. It's not like a all-encompassing rehabilitation of a project. On the right is, is uh, Gethsemane Church in downtown Raleigh, and this got hit by the tornado in 2011, and it shifted the roof and broke some of the concrete blocks. Coming along down here, you can see the ghost, I mean the shadow mark where some of the blocks had shifted. And the idea here was just to put the building back to where it was before it got hit by the tornado to take it off the city's condemnation list. Rehabilitation is what we see the most of. And rehabilitation is where you're taking a property, a historic property, and you're adapting it for a efficient contemporary use, but you're keeping those features and finishes that say that the property is historic and identify the property as being historic. And this is what we do most of day in, day out. This is, this is like almost 99% of what we do. Restoration, more of a museum type quality project, and that's where you're removing features and finishes that were added after the period of significance or you're putting things back in that were added after the period of significance. And every property that's listed in the National Register has a period of significance and that's obviously the dates for which that property is significant. And in Rosenwald schools it's going to be usually when the property was built to like the last graduating class. And again, these are like museum type projects typically. And in my 25 years, I've only worked on like three or four of these restoration projects. And then reconstruction, where you put a building back the way it was before at some point in time when it's not there based on archeology span and other documentation. And again, this is like museum type project and this is one of our historic sites. And, and museums and historic sites, those seem to be the properties that, that do that. So considerations to take when you're selecting a treatment for your property. Um, the relative importance of that property in history, is it of national significance? Is it listed for a special event? Is it listed for its association with education, with African American history as Rosenwald schools are? And then the physical condition. Is, it, is the building a mess? Is the building in really good shape? If the building's in pretty good shape, you're not going to have to do a lot of work, and you can do a little bit less, and you, you're probably doing more preservation work versus those you went to Panther Branch yesterday, and we had plenty of roof leaks, and we had holes in the floor, and have to do structural work, so that's going to be a total rehabilitation. And then what the proposed use is, and most of these uses for buildings that we've seen in Rosenwald schools are actually pretty compatible uses. I don't think I've really seen any uses in a Rosenwald school that wasn't a great use. And then code requirements. And one of the things I talked about yesterday was making sure you have a good team when you start getting ready to work on your property because there are good ways of enacting code requirements and there's less sensitive ways. And then the last thing is I would say don't fall into the restoration trap. Lots of people will say I want to make our our school and museum. I think museums, they're like a dime a dozen. There's a lot of competition and to be successful you have to have a really good program and you have to be really vigilant. 
and it's really competitive out there. And I would say one of the worst things for a historic property is that it's underutilized. I think community centers and places like that where you have people in the buildings nearly every week, if not every day, that's probably one of your better uses. So the Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties. These are, there are a set of standards for each of your four treatments. The standards were developed by the Secretary of the Interior several years ago to guide work to historic properties. They're used to judge the appropriateness of work to those properties. Ideally, they should be used by property owners, such as those who are associated with Rosenwald schools. They should be used by developers and architects when working on historic properties. And they are used by our office and the National Park Service when we're required to review work to historic properties. So the standards can be used for all sorts of resource types. You have buildings, sites, structures, objects, and districts. And that's just a summary of what, was, what the standards are. Now the guidelines, they are used to prepare and assist folks in applying the standards to all project work. They're not meant to be case specific and provide direction on exceptions. So what we advise folks is that you assemble a team again that you can work with and get guidance. And I've worked closely with several folks in, in their Rosenwald schools and that's what we advise. And I'm not sure what other states if they have the same availability for staff and other state historic preservation offices. The guidelines pertain to both interior and exterior work. They're written in a recommended and not recommended format. Obviously, if it meets the guidelines, it's in the recommended format, and if it doesn't, it's in the not recommended format. It's a pretty simple layout. The standards are the same for each resource type, but the guidelines differ for each resource type. So for buildings, what you've got, you can see it's broken out into building materials, masonry, wood, metals, exterior building features, interior features, and then other considerations. And there's a little bit of the history, and I'm not going to go over that. And for those of you who are old school, you can actually go out and purchase the books from the government printing office. And then this is the illustrated guidelines for rehabilitating buildings. And this is really helpful. It's full of photographs and it's full of diagrams in there. And here's the publication that the Park Service has done for the four treatments. It includes all the standards for those treatments and it includes the guidelines for all those treatments. And for those of us who are landscape architects, we even got our own set of guidelines and uh, standards. This is the treatment of historic properties or treatment of historic landscapes. And then just recently we've got standards for rehabilitation with illustrated guidelines on sustainability for historic buildings. Now to the website, you can go to the National Park Service, you can Google Secretary of the Interior Standards and you'll come up with the four different treatments and the guidelines and the standards that accompany those treatments. And here's the illustrated, it's got the same photograph that's on the uh, cover. Now what I like about the guidelines is right up front is this is the format that they tell you to do. It's one, two, three, four for what your features are there. And people will call us up all the time and say, I want to replace my windows, I want to make them energy efficient, I want to replace this, I want to replace this. What they tell you to do for rehabilitation, identify, retain, and preserve, number one, historic features and finishes. Two, protect and maintain those historic features and finishes. Three, repair those historic features and finishes. Fourth, you replace them in kind only if it's too deteriorated to be repaired. So that's your fourth stop for your existing fabric. It's not your beginning point as so many people start off with, with that notion. It also gives advice for the design of missing features and alterations and additions. <coughs> And as a point, there are many local governments where you have local historic districts that also refer to the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation and uh, several local governments that may not even have a set of design guidelines. This may be what they use as the Secretary of the Interior Standards. So now I'm going to go through all the standards and show you a bunch of different examples. 
Standard one, a property shall be used as it was historically or be given a new use that requires minimal change to its distinctive materials, features, spaces, and spatial relationships. And what we mostly see, community centers, museums, a little bit of retail and churches and, and uh, uh, residential and things like that. It's, and, and again, this, if you can't meet standard one, you're really in trouble. And I don't think that most uses that I've seen going to Rosenwald schools have been bad uses. It's, it just depends on how you do it. And this is the Princeville School. And this is in Princeville, which is in Edgecombe County. There it is, all right. And this was the first Freedmen's community that was incorporated in the country. So what you've got, this is your beginning plan, this is your proposed plan. It was just a three teacher classroom. You had these two rooms, these, these three rooms, and then the industrial room over here. This little bit of this partial, this wall that was here was separated the back room from the cloak closet, cloak room, and at some point in time, they had come in and partitioned everything off on the left side. But basically, everything on the right was still preserved. So what the plan was, and this is going to be a, a museum and a visitor center, so what the idea was to keep everything that had not been altered before, keep those open spaces, open spaces. So the hall in these two rooms, and then they, they were going to have like busloads of kids coming through here. So they put the men's and the women's toilet. They put the mechanical room and the kitchen in the back, class, the back classroom. Then the front classroom was divided for office and gift store. And just a few photographs. You can see the space in the upper right is basically the full volume and all the materials. They went a little crazy with all the lighting fixtures, but that's OK. And then the space in the lower left, that was the rear room. Those are the bathrooms off to the left. And then the other full height walls in the mechanical room and then the little kitchenette has that half wall and made that wall a half wall and then this wall in the lower right and this is the office and the gift stores on the other side made that a little half wall because it wasn't significant and people would know easily if they weren't an architectural historian that was a later wall and they could pop it out in the future harnett county training school which is currently being worked on right now and this should be up and running in a couple months it's uh as you can see, you got your classroom from 1922, and that's a two-story building. Looks like a consolidation era school. What's well, going to be residential? 1927, they came in with additional classroom space, and all the other buildings are all one story. That's going to be classroom for the community college. The gym, still going to be a gymnasium. Cafeteria and home economics buildings were built in 1956 and are all mid-century modern buildings. Cafeteria is going to be the culinary school for the community college. And the home economic building will be will house house the barber shop on one side, and it's going to uh, house uh, open community space for all the residents in the in the residential area. And then this is the two-story school, typical two-story school. It looks just like a consolidation area school. It's a double-loaded corridor, so you've got classrooms on both sides, and then they basically double the footprint. The square footage of the existing building is 9,000. The addition, it looks a little bit bigger, but it's actually 8,000 square feet. And it, it was kind of pushing it. We had to go back and alter a few things and go through design review to get it a little bit smaller. And that's going to be a three-story addition, all within the height of the two-story historic building. And I'll show you a section of that later. The Morgan School in Nash County. Just a two-room classroom, and early on, probably like in the 70s, it looks like somebody had cut the right classroom up for residential space. So it was proposed that it would be residence again. So we said that that side had already been cut up. Let's just use that side again and put our other partition walls for additional bathrooms and bedrooms. And that's what they did. And then the living and dining room still stays in the one classroom space in the upper right, which is left open. And then the industrial rooms just cut up one, one wall for a kitchen and for a washer dryer. Also seen retail shops. I don't think this antique store is there anymore. And then churches. And you can see that the basic form here is retained, but they, they lost most of their windows. And it looks like they, since they took the window sills out, it looks like most of the windows were removed. And they added a steeple and added a front gable porch front. 
And then they took out the partition wall between the classrooms, and you can see that with the uh, little trim board that's here, and you can see the ghost line where the flue used to be that went through the roof. Standard two, historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of distinctive materials or alteration of features, spaces, and spatial relationships that characterize a property shall be avoided. So you gotta figure out what kind of school you've got. Is it a, is it a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven teacher classroom? <laughs> is are there local adaptations, which mostly schools seem to have local adaptations. Are there any surviving outbuildings with these schools? Is the school a single building? Is it a campus? Is it a building that's had additions made to it during the period of significance? What type of construction? Is it a frame? Is it a wooden frame construction? Is it a mid-century modern? And then what, what's the period of significance? And I'm not going to go through all these, I'm just going to flick through them really quick. But you got the one teacher, two teacher, three, four, and these are all available online too, six, seven classroom buildings. So here you have a bunch of different uh, single buildings. Here you've got one in Wilmington, and Dr. Littlefield talked about some of these buildings were as nice as the white schools and this is one that's in Wilmington and this is a really fabulous building and it's got an addition for the stair tower and it's got a later addition off back and in some cases the, the original building the whole reason why the school is in that location the original building is basically just an artifact now this is down in Pender County and they built this mid-century building out in front of it and I can assure you as soon as they did that Nobody put a dime into the building out in the back, and it's basically just an artifact. But that's the building that's being worked on now, or has other work done to it. And then in Sampson County, where you've got this uh, uh, campus now, basically, you've got your original building, and it's got the two-story auditorium in the back. You've got a classroom and a classroom. You've got a cafeteria, or a gymnasium, excuse me, and then a, a concrete block cafeteria off to the east. Then wood frame construction, the Hamilton School in Martin County, it's all wood except for the masonry piers and then the flue. All the interior features are all wood. It's all beaded board, wood floors, uh, wood beaded board, wood walls. And then masonry and frame, Hayes School out in Martin County also. And then the mid-century modern buildings. And this is a really nice building and here you can see that the structure is what's being shown off with all the minimalist architecture going on. You've got your masonry, exterior load bearing masonry walls where your concrete wrapped steel beams come out and then they rest on the, on the steel columns within the mullions of the windows and then they rest on the interior load, load bearing partition walls. And then other features you need to look for, you've got nice porticos in a lot of this. This upper left is a portico and anise which means it's set back. And then you've got little secondary, this is all in the same, same uh, campus, you've got all these little secondary entrances with all these great little hoods. And on the front of that building you have these two little wings with the side gables with all this nice decorative brickwork coming in on the gable end. And then here too you have a mid-century building with, with dog tooth panels underneath the windows. Going back to the Williston School, great portico, monumental steps. And then you get the other end where it's a lot more simpler um, than another three teacher classroom with a simple frame portico with Tuscan columns. The Hayes School, um, very early on it looks like they, they added this and this was like the seven teacher plan and instead of using these as their classrooms they put their stage here and just build additional classrooms going out the back and then early on they added another addition out here. So all of that done during the period of significance and when it gets time to work on the building what I would say is it would be nice to retain, I'm not saying keep it open, but kind of make it look like it's open and do a lot of glazing so people get a feel for what was going on originally. Open space also, you look at some of these larger classrooms or schools and you've got this H-shaped plan so you've got a 
porch that stretches across the front, and obviously people hung out on porches, and then they would gather in the interior courtyard, and same with in the back. And on the back, you have this great little water fountain, this concrete water fountain out at the school. Auditoriums and stages, obviously key features, probably the key features for the building. Going back to the Hayes School, the one I just showed you where they took out the two classrooms, and then they decided to put, that's where their stage was. And down below on, on, at Price School, you've got your original seating and your slope floors, and it would be easy just to open up that space and take out the, the uh, drop ceiling. Sampson County, their auditorium is key, and something that we were talking about when we went down there last August. It's got this really ugly roof detail where the auditorium is two stories, and it sticks up. So you've got this cross gable across the front of it, and you're draining half the water from there. You got to get the water off the auditorium, and then you got these little uh, valleys in between. And how do you get all that water off? And I think it was probably a problem from early on. First time I looked at it, it was leaking, and it's still leaking. But on the inside, where you got the auditorium, it's really a great space. And these windows going down either side are a key feature, and something I would say to retain that. You're not going to see those windows on the outside, so I would say just go ahead and, and do whatever roofing you're going to do, and you can go over on top of those windows on the outside, because the only way you're going to see them, and you can see, you're not, you don't really see these windows unless you're way back here or up on the roof. And then you can just roof over them on the outside. And then you've got your stages and your smaller schools, all key features, and some of your local adaptations, most of these uh, two-room classrooms where you've got your stage and you can see your stage coming out over here. They have this little transverse hall and you've got your two doors, but this school in Pender County, you have to step up to the stage level out on the outside porch and that was the only one of those that I had seen. Then your mid-century modern buildings. This is going back to Harnett County and the before is on the lower left. It had drop ceilings. They were originally going to go back and put drop ceilings back. And we said, why don't you just leave the drop ceilings out and go and show the exposed truss work that was there to begin with, which was the original intent. And you can see it's a pretty simple building on the outside. You got an addition over here, but the interior has these bar joists and beams, and there are actually a lot of skylights. So I think it was the right decision to go back and show all those skylights. And then the gym on the same campus, they had dropped the ceiling in there too. You can barely see a little bit of a drop ceiling in the gym. And they took all that out. We thought the steel windows were in, but they were not. They put the steel windows back in and fabricated new windows to, to replicate what was there. And it's a fabulous space. So you've got a hierarchy of, of spaces inside of buildings too. When you walk into a quarter, that's like your main public space. This is the 1923 classroom building at Harnett County with that campus. You've got your ceiling height retained, you've got your wood ceilings and your wood floors are all being retained. They sheetrocked on top of the plaster walls and then they uh, put their, their trim back on top of that to set it out in the right plane. And then the Baltimore School in Bladen County, all of this material is still here. We got your wood ceiling and walls and floors still there. And then same for Sampson High School with the nice Wayne's coat. And then the very reason why all, we're all here is you got to have kids and they're all in the classrooms. Again, going back to the Baltimore School. And this is basically a, is how I look at this, is preservation instead of rehabilitation. They don't have a whole lot of money, but they're using the building. They just put a brand new roof on it, but they haven't done anything covering up finishes later. So it's all right there. You got all your wood finishes right there. The only change that they've done is they put these little window units in and whenever they get money, it's easy enough to just go in and install central air and then feed everything from up in the attic and then they can pull that out of the window and fix their window sash back. Russell School, for those of you who have been there, and, and I know Robert Bull did a training session last year, and this is probably one of the most intact schools I've seen. Everything is there. It's like they left the building when, after integration, locked it, and they came back like 30 or 40 years later, and they just dusted everything off and painted it, and it's all there. It's a fabulous space. It's one of the best preserved schools I think I've seen. You got all your interior woodwork, your transoms, you've got your windows there. Uh, You've got your folding door partition wall. This is going back to Harnett County and something that we'll see when you've got 
residential uses in a building. And again, this is a, the cross hall, double loaded corridor, so you've got classrooms on the front and on the back side. This is a floor plan from the architect and then a reflected ceiling plan. So your floor plan's looking down, your reflected ceiling plan's looking up. And what we'll typically do, and this is done on almost every school that we've done for 25 years I've been there, the outside wall where you've got your windows, you maintain your volume of space, you maintain your ceiling height. You come in along the corridor wall and that's where you put your mechanical room, that's where you put your pantry, that's where you put your kitchen, that's where you put your bathroom. And there you can put like an eight foot ceiling. All your ductwork can run behind the wall, behind this wall. Here's your outside wall with your windows and here's looking toward the outside wall. And you can see your ceiling height steps down. So you can see your ductwork in here and your mechanical closet is back here. So it's a nice way of preserving a lot of the space, of, uh, the feel for what it was originally. And it's easily removed in the future if anybody ever wants to go and change it. Your, your outbuildings that go with these schools, gyms, you see an amazing amount of gyms still, even though I don't think that they were probably the best built. A lot of them are wood and they're sitting right on the ground amazingly, but they're still there, a lot of them. And then occasionally you get a privy too. So I think that tells an important st st part of the story. They're all Rosenwald schools with just very few examples. And, and some of these that I'm going to show you now are not Rosenwald schools, just, just to illustrate the point, because in this standard and another standard, it, I really couldn't find anything. So this one talks about making buildings earlier, that you don't want to dress them up to look earlier. Um, and it says, each property shall be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use. Changes that create a false sense of historical development, such as adding conjectural features or elements from other historic properties should not be undertaken. And I really had a hard time finding this. I thought I'd found one or two items and I was like, all right, but it doesn't really happen and I'm not quite sure why. I think some of the reasons were that they were schools. And I think along with like consolidation era schools, you know, they were built to take a beating and you just didn't do a whole lot of changes. You might put a drop ceiling in, you might add central air. That's about all you're really doing to them. Um, after integration, I've seen plenty of local governments for some reason that didn't sell them right away. I've seen some that they just sold in the last 10 or 20 years, amazingly enough. I don't know why they're hanging on to them for so long. And then I think with every year, there's a greater appreciation and a greater awareness of what you've got. So people who are acquiring the properties more recently are not, they're a lot more sensitive to what they've got. So this is the one I thought I had one of those ah things. I, this is a Warren County school and you got all this stuff that looks like it's Victorian architecture. You got turn post columns, you got bric-a-brac brackets on there, you got shingles in the gable end. Well, there's three of them like that in Warren County from the 1920s. And I guess somebody just said, well, I like that stuff that my mom did 30 years ago, so that's what I'm going to do. And then in Columbus County, you've got these like Gothic revival arches that were on that school, and I found them on another school too. And then this, this is like, this is really picky, but this is like the worst thing I could find. And these are like these pilasters inside this corridor, and then they, they just used them for a light well just to provide up lighting. And this, and they just did it for lighting. They weren't doing it for ornamental reasons, but I, I think it's in the main corridor, and that's why it's, that's why it's, I wouldn't have done it, but that's, that's the only thing I could find. So to show you some other projects where people have done it that are not Rosenwald schools, the house on the upper left is what this house used to look like. And these were sister houses in downtown Raleigh. And somebody just had a really simple house with a full width porch on the first floor, a gable end, one over one sash, a little bit of Victorian decorative work on their porch and they decided they wanted a federal house and they wanted to make it look earlier. And then people are always doing this on houses. They're always going in with additional millwork. They're adding chair rails where they didn't have any. They're, they're adding crown molding and really big crown molding. But just again, just to illustrate the point. Standard four is somewhat similar and it says changes to a property that have acquired significance in their own right shall be retained and preserved. Again, not a lot of changes 
to schools, Rosenwald schools, but most of the changes that we have seen are typically adding square footage to the schools, and that was done obviously when it was a school, so it was during the period of significance for that school, and thus it's significant. After it went into private ownership, that's where you get people coming in and making changes to the finishes, and it's not significant. So again, going back to the um, Harnett County Training School, you've got a 66-year period of significance, 1922 when they built the first building, 1968 when the grad, last graduating class graduated. So all these buildings that were added are all during the period of significance. And here's your photographs of them. You've got your two-story out there, and it's got a later stair tower addition to it on either end. You got your 1956 cafeteria building, you got your 1956 multi-purpose building, your 1927 classroom, and then the gym. All of those contributing buildings, all within the period of significance. And then going down a little bit further, just looking at the gym, the original footprint of the gym was just, just a rectangle here. They built this big old addition off the front of it. They built a big addition off both sides and off both ends and basically wrapped it through the years all while it was a school, so all during the period of significance again. On the interior, uh, again, the windows were added. They, they used to have these little things. We thought the windows were in there. They were not, so they fabricated new sash. And then some really nice details underneath the bleachers where you'd watch the basketball games in 1948, they put those pressed tin ceilings. So when they did their addition in the back, which is this space, the boxing area. They also put t pressed tin ceilings, but at the front entrance, I know we all like revisionist history, it's sort of like, oh, what'd they do at the front? Well, up front, coming in, they just had a Celotex ceiling, which was the modern thing, and look, make it look new and fancy and all. And then I went to this school a couple weeks ago, and the comment was made to me when they did a floor patch that they took it from the last edition because it wasn't a Rosenwald school. But again, it's all historic. This is another three teacher. It faces north, south. I think this one is a different one, different plan than most of the ones you see. And they had an early edition, then they had another edition. Well, they had some termite damage here and they patched the floor and they took it out of the, the section over here, right in the middle of the floor. And I guess the thing that I would say, it's all historic. I understand the reasoning, but it's all a historic space. And what I would have done is just go out and buy a new floor to match the original that I was trying to get it to match and just do that. Because now you've got two floors you've got to patch. And then some wrappings of historic buildings. And you can see you've got a church that probably helped build the Rosenwald School. And that's the, uh, the two teacher. And then this thing's been added to. It's been wrapped in vinyl siding. I think it does have its original press, uh, standing seam metal roof on it, but that's about the only thing. All the windows got changed out. And you can even see their open porch where you've got a ghost mark here where they were trimming it out, where they put the vinyl siding in in two different stages. And then the building on the right has all been wrapped in vinyl and, and, mason, and masonry. <clears throat> and then some other examples of, of when uh, Poor, poor little schools get uh, over, over design and overwork, and you'll see this a lot, wrapping them in vinyl siding, and then the big old windows, they get taken out, and you get vinyl windows or really small windows which just don't look right being put in. And a little something different, uh, I'm not sure why they went vertical on this one, but they did go vertical on this one and your corner board comes all the way from the base and it stops here. So they raised it by like four or five feet, which is a lot of work to go vertically instead of just telescoping out the back. And then they dropped the floor in on the interior photograph and lowered the ceiling height a little bit just to get vertical stacking. I guess it's storage, I'm not sure what it is. And then, uh, this is a school that's basically an artifact now. Pretty early on, it was just the one teacher. And then they came on pretty early on and added a, a little addition out the back for a second classroom. And nice little solution. Um, not sure why they did it, but they took that off at some later point. It may not have been in good shape, or they may have been just trying to restore it to its original construction. I'm not sure what they were doing there. <clears throat> and then other changes that aren't really significant. New concrete block 
foundation and stoop. I'm not sure why they did that. I don't think I've really seen many, if any, buildings where all the piers are shot all at the same time. I mean, you might have to replace a pier here or there. You may need to replace some brick within your piers here or there. But I don't think usually you, you need to come in and replace all your piers. And then what we did at Princeville is we kept all the original piers where they hadn't been overbuilt. And then we had new infill and it was set in two inches or maybe the depth of a full brick. And so when you're looking at a distance, those original piers really do read and you can still see the original rhythm of what they had done. Uh, some later interior partition walls. The Price School, this one's in the middle of the hallway. Again, most prominent space. I'm not sure why they did that. Not significant. I would pull it out. The partition wall that we added at Princeville, again, not significant, only eight foot tall. And then at EJ Hayes, this is a real good solution. They got like 12 classrooms, I think. And when you've got probably three or four classrooms, you're going to have to start looking at putting like separate men's and women's bathrooms depending on what you're doing in there. So you need that space and you're going to need some other support space. So what they did is they said, let's just take one of the classrooms, we'll put the, both toilets in there, we'll put a janitor's closet and a little hallway on the back side. You'll just come in the door where you used to go in the classroom and there's a hall right up there to access the other rooms. It was a nice little solution for it. <clears throat> Later finishes, again, out of the period of significance, not important. This is the school that was turned in for residential property, the upper left, and they had that parquet flooring. Well, we took all the partition walls out, so the parquet flooring obviously went in with the partition walls and doesn't have significance. I would just take all that parquet flooring out and use the original floors that are underneath. And then you can see here that basically everything's been covered. You've got a new ceiling, you got carpet, everything on the outside has been coated with new sheetrock and, and brought out. They've taken out partition walls. And then same thing here at this school, except for one change. And they either kept their original stage or else they built a new stage where the stage was. And then something that I think is a really minimal expense but makes a big difference is taking out your later drop ceilings, especially where they cross over transom windows and where they cross over your exterior windows. <clears throat> Standard five, distinctive materials, features, finishes, and construction techniques are examples of craftsmanship that characterize a property shall be preserved. And this is the Princeton School in Johnston County. And everything looks okay until you get to this side and you get this little half timbering thing, which is really kind of crazy. I don't think I've ever seen that on a Rosenwald school. It's basically where you're showing the structure and then you're, you're stuck going in between. It's like, like something you'll see in like Tudor Revival schools, I mean, which are Tudor Revival houses, which are of the same period, but I've never seen it on a Rosenwald school. And then porch treatments, and again, local adaptations. This one I already showed you. They decided to go retro. Let's go back for something that mom did. And then over here, you got your bungalow one where you've got your, your piers that come up. You've got a tapered column on top. And then let's just do bare bones in the upper right. It's just, there's, there's no gable vent. It's just sided over. And then you've got uh, just like square post on the porch. Some of the features you see on the inside, which, is, which would be great to keep, this is Princeville. That was one of the blackboards, and that's in the office. And when they had an alumni reunion, all the alums signed that at one of the reunions. And I think it's a little cool piece, and it's been there for a while, um, where you've got your, your rooms that adjoin, and they've got those partition walls that are built in a different array. These, so, so you can open them up and have an assembly space. These are roll-up doors here, and this building's not long for this world. You've got folding door partition walls, and then this one where you've got the blackboard, which actually lifts up into the wall cavity, and then you can open up the space. And then this one, which is really great, just saw this a couple weeks ago in Martin County, and this one, all these, all these have like this middle uh, partition wall to help bear the weight at, at where your partition comes. And then you've got these, these doors which, which fold up, but they're all done by rope and pulley. And then you just tie it off on the other end of where you're pulling it up from. And then miscellaneous features again, you got your clear story windows in some of these, some of these buildings. You've got your stage. 
you've got you've got this one and most of them just have but most of them don't have boxies like on this one. Most of them have exposed rafter ends, but that one's got a boxy with a nice little gable return. And then these little um, corner boards have this little pilaster cap on top here. So a nice little detail. And then this one, which is like over the top, and this has all this great trim work on it. It's got all this, this, this nice gable vent, and it's got all this dental work up in the uh, freeze board. And again, that one also has the corner boards with the pilaster cap. Masonry details, parapet walls, again, the dog tooth, which I already showed you, dog tooth panel. And then even the simple details, like a water table, and then these nice brick panels where you have a blank wall where you're doing some detailing. Interior, you've got your built-ins, you've got doors, you've got transoms, you've got windows occasionally on the inside of hallways. And again, since it's a school, you got lockers. And then your mid-century modern buildings, which I already showed you before in the simplicity of the structure where, where you can see how it's all built and how it's all being held up. And then your doors and transoms, and most of them are painted, but occasionally you get this one that's stained on the outside. And then your banks of windows, another key feature of any Rosenwald school that you see. And then this one, which is a little bit of a spin on that, where you got your banks of windows and then you got transom windows above that. And then, I don't know if I've ever seen this except for this school, where the ridge beam comes out and protrudes out. I've seen some of them that have brackets. That was the only one I was able to find on that. And a couple of them, including Panther Branch, have a drip edge at the bottom. Again, most of them with exposed rafter ends, and then square edge siding, and you'll see a lot of buildings with German siding on it, too. Going back to the Harnett County School, where they're, where they're adding to the two-story school with a three-story addition in the back, this is their point of connection. This is the historic school. This is their new corridor, and they went out here with their new door, and it's going out where we had a window, but what we're doing is is we're keeping this detailing. Everything above the lintel is stained, and then they're cutting, and they've actually cut here already their, their joint, so they're taking out the jams, and this will be where you pass through. So we've retained this, so when you come up, you'll know you had a window or a door. You'll be able to figure out it was a window because it was just one out the space originally, and then this window is being kept too, and originally they wanted to block that in, and we said just keep it, and on the inside there's a residential unit on the other side. They just sheetrocked over it, so on the inside, you don't have your window, which goes into a fire-rated corridor. But on, the, but on this side, the public side, you'll see that you have your window. And then other details. All these classrooms had like two doors going into all the classrooms. You didn't want two doors going into a residential unit, so they blocked one of them off. And this is on the hall side. What they should have done is kept the door here. I figured that one out after the fact. But they kept the trim, so you know that there was a door there to begin with. And then at Sampson County, in the corridors, you've got these nice nine light doors with a six light panel above it, and then they just sheet rocked over on top of that. And I think it, it just gave them a 20-minute rating, but that was a single-story building, and that, that made the building inspector happy to do that. Other details, if you have a standing seam roof, it's probably the best roof. You've got composition shingle roofs that were on a lot of these, wood shingle roofs also listed in their specs, and then occasionally you had a pressed tin shingle roof, too. And then, I've never seen one of these until I was going through our, our picture files the other day, and somebody's got a pot belly stove in one, and it's even hooked up to the flue instead of just sitting in the middle of the room. Standard six, deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced, where the severity of deterioration requires replacement of a distinctive feature <coughs> The new feature shall match the old in design, color, texture, and where possible materials. Replacement of missing features shall be substantiated by documentary and physical evidence. Windows. This is like key for me. I get tired of all the people telling me they want to replace their windows. The windows are key features for your buildings. I mean, they are the eyes to what everybody sees. And as any, anybody who went to Panther Branch yesterday, and they are new windows because we didn't have them, but that's like the first thing you see when you drive up there. You see the big expanse, and then you see your windows. This is a window workshop that we helped pay for at a CLG money years ago. 
teaching people how to fix up their windows. Several reasons to keep your windows. The newer sash, the material, is not old growth wood. Almost everything that you've got in your windows from the 1920s and your 19 teens building is really good lumber. It's got a lot more growth rings. The fact that they're still there after decades and maybe generations of just outright neglect tells you what kind of a quality material that you've got. The sash can be easily repaired. You just need a few tools and a little bit of know-how. You can go online and figure out how to repair your own window sash. Newer sash have a finite life. I mean, all those, the insulated glass that comes in there, basically what they do is they'll pull the sash out and replace it with a new sash. That insulated glass has a finite life. When that anti-desiccant between the two panes of glass soaks up all the moisture, it's going to soak up. That's when you start getting moisture problems, and then you got to replace it. So with a single pane piece of glass coupled with a storm window, I think it's a really good solution. And some of the information that we've seen says that if you have a single glazed window with a storm window, it's, it can be up to 15% more in energy, energy efficient than a replacement window, insulated window. And then replacing your, another thing about replacement windows, at Fort Bragg, we're reviewing replacement windows of replacement windows. They're on their third generation of replacement windows. So you want to talk about sustainability. I don't think it's really sustainable to replace windows every, every 20, 25 years, especially when you've got windows, historic windows that are still there in our buildings. So when you're working on your windows, don't go out there with a sheet of plywood and just nail it or screw it into the jam. This is the proper way how to do it. And uh, you cut your, you cut your uh, plywood to shape or to size. And then you got your two by fours on the outside and on the inside, a carriage bolt, and you just drill a hole, you put your carriage bolt in there, and you, you're basically clamping it shut so it's all held in place. And you can't get to it from the outside. Your, your screws and nuts, remember to put them on the inside, not the outside. Occasionally, this is, this is what I've done, recommended for if you have like lead poison children as you can look at putting a jam liner. It's probably not going to be an issue with most projects that you have, uh, but it is an option if, if lead paint's of concern. Here's some images of insulated glazing. This again was a conscious effort at Harnett County. They just said whatever it's going to be, whatever the lifetime is, we're going to go in and put insulated glass because we don't want to put storm windows on this building. And then you can do some other things such as weather stripping in the, in the left. Storm windows. Um, again, big proponent of storm windows. You can go in with a full sheet of glazing, and this is at Hayes, and you look at this, but when you look at it at a raking angle, and this is a really good way that I've recommended to people in the past, but when you look at it at a raking, raking angle, it, you catch a lot of reflectivity from it because it's just a big sheet of glass. And probably what I'd recommend is that you just come in with like a, uh, a meeting rail where the meeting rail was historically. So you've got two sheets of glass and you're breaking that expanse up a little bit. And again, your steel windows. People will, this one had asbestos in the glazing compound. Well, in most cases for what we do, asbestos isn't an issue. If you tear the building down, you're required to remove, abate the asbestos before you put the building in a landfill. So you might as well just go ahead and take the asbestos out of the, uh, out of the glazing compound and fix them, which is what they did here. And I think that it made a huge difference, and I think it's a really nice project. The Porterville School, you can see the windows in this front gable in this left. These are these windows. But over here, they, they, they narrowed them in. And you can sort of see where the siding was patched in. And same on the side, they only had the one bank of windows, but you can see what they did, which is what they did at Panther Branch. They just, they just put a new stud wall or right up on the stud wall that was there and they just resided over it. So we just pulled all the siding off and this would be easy if you wanted to restore the windows here because you've got your original windows in place. Shop drawings and architectural drawings, if you're gonna replace your windows, and this is what we did at Panther Branch. This is another project, but we had a section through your head of your window, this top section, through your sill, through your jam, through your mullion, which is between the two windows, and then through the mutton bar. We got drawings that were large scale drawings of the existing and of the proposed. <coughs> Other key features, some of these areas between your two assembly spaces have been filled in. Uh, it would be easy enough to open up again in many cases. And then these may even be the doors from there. And 
somebody cut the bottoms off, but I think you can go back and do some millwork on that and maybe have to replace the bottom panel, but you can probably get a really good millwork or just to fix the bottom and go back and retain, keep the whole door. And then in the upper right, some of the doors got replaced with flush doors. Again, after the period of significance and not a key feature. Almost all these schools have like five or six horizontal panel doors. Sometimes what we've seen, and this is going back to Harnett County, and had roof leaks. So a lot of the plaster was coming off. So what they did is they, they furred out the wall. They put a new sole plate and new studs. So this is going to be the new surface for the wall. That allows you to run your electric up in that space. And then you can sheetrock on top of it. And it should be OK since the roof has been fixed. Also, one of the code issues, we were able to keep all the features and the volume of space in the corridors. But in the residential side, they had to give it a one hour rating. So the ceilings and the walls were all covered with sheetrock and the floors they put a plastic sheet down and then they put a layer of gypcrete and then they went on top of that with their new floor. So in the future, I guess the gypcrete's not optimal, but you can always come back and remove the later layer of floor and then you can pop your gypcrete off. You got a sheet of plastic there if, if, if you can go back and use your wood floor in the future. Here, your roofing materials, I said before, standing seam roof. If you got one, do what you can to keep it. It's the best roof out there. If it's well maintained, it should be at least a 200 year roof. Many of them get pitted. This is the Poe House. It's a state owned museum in Fayetteville. We just went and looked at this at the beginning of the year. Instead of replacing it, we're going to put an elastomeric coating on top. And basically, you just get all the rust off. You put like a primer on, you put a top coat, and then you put like a fabric on top of that, and you put another coat on top of that. A lot of the roofs that they install today, they call them standing seam, but they're really prefabricated, and they got all these ridges, and they don't have the profile of what you had historically. And then you've got all these screws, and that bothers me. Uh, all your penetrations for your roof. You don't want penetrations through your roof. I mean, a, a vent or something like that is OK. And, but you've got literally thousands of holes on your roof, on your brand new roof. And they've got a, they've got a, a, a neoprene washer on there. And those neoprene washers are sitting out there 365 days a year. They're baking in the sun. They're getting hot. They're getting cold. They're getting rained on. They're getting snowed on. After 10, 15, 20 years, I don't know how long they're going to last. One day you're going to go in the building, you're going to have a roof leak. And that's the time when you've got to go up there and you've got to pull them all out and replace all those washers and maybe the screw. So just keep that in mind. Your wood floors, um, or your patching wood floors, just make sure you get the original. You match the original and that with the same species and the same finish and the same width and all that. And you may want to, you may want to alter the course so that you don't have a straight across. Um, uh, seen. And sorry for my crude sketch that I did at 10 o'clock last Saturday night, but um, your, your insulation in your, in your frame walls, they had opened up this building and they put the insulation in here. Well, when you look at this, this is all water staining. So that tells me that the, that the siding has been getting wet historically. So if you put an insulation bat up against that, that's going to get wet. It's going to stay wet. Your siding's not going to dry out. So and this, is what, this is a detail I did on my house where you've got your siding out here and then you've got your interior finish and these things with the X's are your studs. I just came in with three quarter inch material and nailed it to the stud and cut a sheet of rigid insulation and put it up against those two and then I put my bad insulation. Now it was a pain, I'll be honest with you, but I wanted to insulate my walls while it was open. I had to do every cavity. It was a separate cut, and it was a huge pain. But at least I got my walls insulated. Removing paint from walls, all sorts of different methods to do it. Um, here's some of the, the better choices. In the upper left, you got a heat gun, the infrared system. And it doesn't really get hot through infrared. It's, 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 it's making the, the painted surface pliable. And then regular old scraping. Dutchman repairs, if you've got to repair some of your wood instead of replacing an entire piece or an entire door, if you can just do a Dutchman repair, you can do epoxy repairs sometimes. And if you're doing epoxies, just make sure you kill any pathogens and, and hit it with like a borate solution before that and let it dry out before you do your epoxy repair. 
raking out mortar joints is important as repointing buildings. You don't want to go out there and cut your brick. And then for putting features back that were there historically, this is something that was done. Uh, I'm not sure when this was done, probably in the last 10 years. They put a new handicap ramp out there, and you can see that, that, the, that the little shed roof that they put out there. But here you go to the archives, and this is what the porch used to look like. I would say just do a little bit of research. You may get lucky. You may find a documentary photograph, and you can put key features like that back. Also look for ghost marks on your paint. You may be able to find exactly where your pilasters went and where your roof line went. And then this is Harnett County again. And this is one of the additions on the back of the gym. And this was a garage door opening originally, and they wanted a pedestrian opening in there. So what we said, just go ahead and put a, a modern storefront door with a transom above it, and then to the left of it, just put like a corrugated uh, metal that looks like it's a roll-up door. Standard seven, <clears throat> chemical or physical treatments, if appropriate, shall be undertaken using the gentlest means possible. Treatments that cause damage to historic materials shall not be used. So masonry work, people want to come in and, and use really harsh chemical cleaners, but you just start with the gentlest means possible. If that doesn't work, you, you bring it up a notch. And, and any reputable company that does masonry work is going to come out there and they can do you a sample set at a fair price. Uh, and, and that's what I would say is your starting point until you find the product that works best for your building. This is something we did at Fort Bragg, so it's not a Rosenwald school. This is at the uh, former hospital. <clears throat> and I really don't like abrasive cleanings, but it actually seemed to work all right. And a lot of eyes were on this project, and everybody wanted it looking new. So um, it had a lot of organic growth on this, and they got this Rotec Vortec machine, which just rolls off your tongue. And it sends out a solution of like 99% water, and I don't remember what the medium is, but we used it only at 20 pounds per square inch. A lot of these things go up to several thousand, and you'll just abrade everything. And it was limestone, so we were able to look for some of the organics that were in there, and, and it did abrade some of that, but it didn't abrade them all as much as I thought it was gonna do. So we use this to clean the material. And if you're just looking at it before and after, I don't think anybody would be able to figure out that it did anything to it. Sandblasting, don't get a lot of questions, calls about sandblasting anymore, thank goodness. I, when I started 25 years ago, I think there was hardly a month that went by where somebody wasn't calling me up and asking about sandblasting. I don't think I've had a sandblasting question in over a year now, thankfully. But what you're doing is you're taking off the hard-fired surface of the brick and you're creating a surface that's a lot more porous than it used to be. And when you strike that mortar joint, you're also creating a surface that gives some resistance to water penetration. Then when you blast it all off, you, it, you can have a lot of moisture problems if you sandblast a building. And then I've seen plenty of buildings where you still have paint on afterwards, so it, it seems like a poor solution. And it's causing damage to the brick also causing damage to the brick. And this doesn't happen a whole lot. The brick that we're looking at, this is more 19th and 18th century where you've got <clears throat> really soft fired brick and you go in with a hard Portland cement. I'm gonna guess most of the masonry schools here probably have a mix of Portland cement and lime mortar. So you don't wanna go in with a straight mortar or straight Portland cement mix. You wanna get your mortar uh, tested and see how strong it is because you don't want your mortar stronger than the brick is and that's what happens when when, when it is. You'll get the surface falling off. <clears throat> this is a workshop we did several years ago at uh, when the National Park Service, their technical guys were working on the on the Raleigh National Cemetery and I used to tell people don't use mechanical equipment but if you've got a Portland cement joint that's the only way you're cutting into it and it, it just seems like it's the lesser of two evils. And what we've always used historically are just angle grinders to take it off. And now they used, they were doing work last winter. And it's not AmeriCorps, it's something through the trust. I can't remember what it's called. But they had these youths at risk, and they were training them with different trades. And they used this really cool machine called an Arbitec, which is just a reciprocating saw. And you can see it did a good job in some places, but and again, these are guys who are just trying this for the first time, but it, it, you did get some brick that was falling off the front. 
And I think while you're training, that's what they're, that's what's going to happen. <clears throat> but if you're hiring somebody, you expect a, high, a higher threshold, somebody who's done it before. <clears throat> And then these are big no-nos. These are also, this is that national cemetery. And you can see they came down with the grinder and cut right into the masonry. Here's your mortar joint over here, but they cut into the masonry. And then these were professional masons again. They actually cut the head joint, which was a really tiny joint. And then they cut the brick above it also. <clears throat> and then when you repoint, again, there's proper ways of repointing. That needs to be done the proper way too. And this is the same national cemetery with the with the folks, and they were teaching them how to do that. On wood buildings, proper ways to remove paint. I showed you some good ways. Here's some not so good ways. You never want to use an open flame. Uh, it's going way above a thousand. I think it's like 1,200 or 1,400 degrees, and it's going to vaporize the lead and the paint. And you're sitting there and you're breathing it in. And then the next picture over to the right you're going to scar the wood. I mean, you're there with an open flame. You're going to burn the wood. And then this is what happens when you leave chemical strippers on too long. And I've seen this only on a couple buildings. If you insist on using a chemical stripper, just do tiny little sections because <coughs> it'll get away from you. And then damage from a water pressure machine that's cranked up too high. And this is actually on our office where we used to be on Blunt Street in downtown Raleigh. And the guy came out, and it was pre the machine was preset at the factory at like 2,500 pounds per square inch. And you can see that he just ate into the wood. And then when you paint after it, you can still see where the wood was etched. <laughs> and I'm not a fan of vinyl siding, but I think vinyl siding gets blamed for a lot of ills. Um, it, uh, people tell you that you'll rot your building down. If you've got a moisture problem already and you cover it with vinyl, you're going to accelerate your problem that you've got. It could be a damp crawl space where the moisture is just wicking up through the, through the crawl space. Or if you've got a small roof leak, and this was a house in Wilson that had a lot of issues, as you can see. And then we actually had a couple tax credit projects, and even in Rosenwald schools, I think it's really almost every instance the original material is going to be down there. As Mitch in our office says, just apply the lazy man rule. No one's going to take the siding off on a building below it. They're just going to go right on top of it and nail, nail your furring strips and attach your vinyl siding on top of that. So if you're willing to bite the bullet and, and do some work or pay for someone to scrape the building, I think it's a huge improvement removing the vinyl siding from these buildings. And then again, moisture problems. You need to think about moisture and even just a temporary solution. If your roof is in bad shape, just do something, a new rolled roof or something like that, and pipe off the water until you can get a permanent fix. Standard eight, this is another one that I couldn't find anything for, and this is our archaeology. Archaeological resources shall be protected and preserved in place. If such resources must be disturbed, mitigation measures shall be undertaken. I couldn't find anything. Probably the, the time that you might want to do archaeology at a Rosenwald school is if you're trying to find an outbuilding or a specific feature on the site, such as the privy. This is at Aversboro Battlefield, and this was a project that was going to be a restoration of the house, and they were going to have it as a visitor center. And we were doing, we had uh, folks doing ground penetrating radar. We were trying to find where the kitchen was and any other outbuildings. And you can look for anomalies in the surface surfaces at increments below grade level. Standards 9 and 10, new additions, exterior alterations, or related new construction shall not destroy historic materials, features, and spatial relationships that characterize the property. The new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the historic materials, features, size, scale, and proportion, and massing to protect the integrity of the property, its environment, and number 10, new additions in adjacent or related new construction shall be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired. So this one I showed you before. I thought this was a really good solution. It was something that was done early on. It was the one-room schoolhouse in Pender County, and they just telescoped at the back. If you have a small building, it's a really good way of just adding on to it so that it's, it's the least visible area of the building. You're not adding to the front, you're not adding to either side, you're just telescoping up the back. And again, I'm not sure why they took it off, but they did take it off. 
when we were at Russell School last year, and again, this is a school that's really intact, they were talking about providing handicap accessibility and then bathrooms. And so just sitting out there with some folks afterwards, you don't want to go inside because it's just a two-classroom school with the industrial building up front. And one of the ideas that was floated by was talking about putting a ramp on the front. Well, the front of the building sits like almost five feet off the grade, so that's 60 inches. And you can go 30 inches of rise before you need a level pad. So your ramp is going to be like 65 feet or something like that. So you have this really long ramp on the front of the building. So when you come around to the back of the building, and this is where the topography helps us, because come to the back of the building, you can see it's a lot closer. So what we were talking about on site was you just provide like your handicap parking toward the back of the building, and then you can bring a new ramp up here, and then you can make a connection to your historic building, just a minimal location off the back of it, so you're not adding all the way along the back wall, and then you can do like a little corridor with a men's and a women's bathroom. So you're minimizing your connection to the building, and then you're minimizing your connection through the building also, because a nice location, and this flue does not pop out into this room. That's this space, and you can see that your walls come to an angle, and your bulletin board stops a little shy. So you've got like four plus feet, and you can go in there and cut a door opening in there. Um, <clears throat> now this is the Harnett County Training School that I talked to you about before. This is, this is the 9,000 square foot original and the 8,000 square foot plan. And I don't care where it is, everybody always wants to maximize their profit, so that means more square footage, more square footage. So they did the same thing here. And the idea that we were looking at was to get your volume less than what your original building is. So here's a side elevation showing your historic school building. And basically the roof lines line up. You can see it's not taller. Here you have a glazed connection, but instead of two floors, and here's your section through the building, you've got one, two, three floors. <clears throat> And here's some photographs of it. This is standing on the south connection, which is right here, looking out the other way. And again, you can see your roof lines line up. Two stories over here, three stories over on this side. And then the connection to the building, as the standards say, was minimal connection. They basically just did it with this glaze. And you've got these, these little um, cleats that are, that are secured to the building. And then your, then your frame attaches to that. And then I already talked to you about this one, so where our pedestrian connection through the building was, was minimized. <clears throat> and then this is the uh, modern building in, uh, in Selma. And the original plan for this, this has a real low pitched roof. It's probably like a 2 and 12 or a 3 and 12, and it sits in the middle of the campus. They tore the original building down. So no matter where you are out on the block driving around, it's in the middle of the campus, you always see this building. And they wanted to originally put the mechanical units on the roof. And there's four classrooms going down either side. So you'd have these big old boxes going down either side. And we said, uh, why don't you take a look at something else? So they came in with these mini splits. And they mounted these inside. And then they got these little condensers, or uh, yeah, condensing pads on the outside. And I think it was a lot better solution, something that you typically see. And so you're not, you're preserving your exterior lines on your building, and then your interior lines are basically minimal, minimalized. You just have this little unit in there. Now to talk about some stuff that went on at Panther Branch, all those folks who were there yesterday, I'm going to preach to you again. I think the most important thing is board development. And I think that you need to look at when it comes time to working, getting people on your board instead of just asking people, you need to look at filling certain professions and placing them on your board strategically. I think it would be great to look for an architect and or a contractor. Somebody's got preferably historic preservation experience. You need to look at somebody's like a historian, law, um, accountant, someone who can help tell your story, like a publicist, a writer, someone who can help you with web design. And your worker, your, your board members need to be worker bees. We've all been on boards, and I know I've been the chairman of board, and I just want to throttle some people that just come and get the uh, free coffee, and they don't do any work throughout the year. But everybody needs to work. When you get ready to start on your building, you need to assemble a team of people that are going to have experience and have a know-how. This is where you need to hire an architect, and I advise you that to do that so that you don't make costly mistakes.
if you make mistakes, it can cost you in time, it can cost you in money, it can cost you in a loss of historic fabric, and I think you can lose some goodwill with your neighbors when, you, when you're out there trying to raise money. So you need to be careful of that and make sure you keep your mistakes to a minimum. You don't want to hire people without any experience because you don't want them cutting their teeth on your project and then you need to plan long term. Most projects that we see, these grassroots organizations, unless somebody dies and writes you a check for a half a million dollars, you're gonna be at it for a long time. You need to think five, 10, 15, 20 years, and you need to think first about mothballing that building. Make sure that you have a good roof like they did at Panther Branch. We don't have to worry about the roof leaking anymore. Now we're gonna work on the floor and make sure that that's all secure, and then the rest is structure, and then we can do everything after that. And then when you finish your project, congratulations. But now you've got to think about how you're going to pay the light bill, how you're going to pay the insurance bill, how you're going to do everything you need to do in the future. Uh, there's still a lot of work. What's your organization like? Is everybody thinking that they're done and they can go home? You need an organization there, and I'm getting some nods from the audience. You need to make sure your organization is healthy five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. So at Panther Branch, we have the three classroom plan with your industrial room and your cloak room. This wall was not here. The owner said we want to use those rear two spaces and you can see that the, no, it's not on that plan but it's in the plan that Laurie with David's office drew. You've got these folding door partition walls. They want to be able to open and close those and have assembly space. So that required that they had separate men's and women's bathrooms. You can do a single fixture for the men's, two for the women's, and the plan was you wanted both of your bathrooms being accessed from the hall, not from the assembly space. So cut the cloakroom up into a kitchenette and put the men's bathroom in there. And then, like I showed you what they did at Hayes, this was a really good solution. Just come in here with another wall where we can put the women's bathroom, come over here and put the storage. That way you're still preserving most of this classroom. You can still have functions in there, and you've only taken a little bit out of it. You made it the same size as the industrial room, but your two main spaces are your, well, your, your corridor is a main space, but also your assembly spaces at the rear. Those were the key features that they wanted to retain, and I think it worked out well. And Well, they haven't done it yet, but it's a good plan. And then the other thing was decided to put the ramp at the back of the building, and these windows are slid toward the back, and these windows are slid toward the front of the space, so we had about five or six feet over here, and that's where they decided to cut the door. And when we started, just like the other school I showed you, they had taken all these windows out, basically. But you can see your vertical seam, and this is where they just went in on top of the existing studs and just nailed new siding on top of that. So we took it down. We went up to St. Matthews, which is up northern part of the county, and they had their original windows, and we measured those windows and uh, did some shot drawings. And then this is the north window in the cloakroom. That had also been changed and uh, went back and replaced that. So these are the field sketches that I did when I went up to St. Matthews, and this is the section through the sill. And you've got your two window sash slides, you've got your interior stool, you've got your apron, you've got your window sill, and, you, and you've got your wall. And when Laurie, David, and I were talking, it was like, let's just bring Stevenson out there. They're the fabricator. They can go out to St. Matthews. And I said, when we review drawings, I want the drawings to look like the drawings that I've drawn. So here are our first set. And we only had one revision. This one does not have a... Uh, um, parting bead between the two sash, so the other ones had a parting bead, so we just said to put that in. And then we okayed them and they installed them, and they look fabulous. And here they are. <clears throat> the other thing that we did is we had a painting workshop last, last year, and uh, last November, I guess, after the, after the weather cooled down a little bit. And the estimate for painting the building was $20,000. I said, Barbara, I said, let's get together. You get all the guys, you buy the materials and the supplies, and we'll do a workshop. We'll work with everybody to go out there and tell them how to scrape the building. I called the epidemiology section with the Department of Health and Human Services and made sure everybody was outfitted okay. We all had headgear on, we all were wrapped head to toe. 
We all had respirators and told them how to properly scrape everything. And they scraped the building themselves. And uh, time was running out, but they did pay someone to, to paint the building. So these numbers are not right. I thought that the materials cost were only two to $3,000, but they did pay $7,000. So it was basically a 50% savings. Uh, we got a paint job for $10,000 instead of $20,000. And I think what I liked about this, I said that this, this reminds me of like the Rosenwald struggle too, is that they had to go through and so much to build these schools. And I said, this gets buy-in from your membership too. And I think it helps tell your story. And I think it helps people who are looking at donating money and telling you that y'all are serious because you're going out there and you're doing a lot of work yourself. Then this is a structural report from the engineer. And there was a few issues in here. And Basically, with the assembly space, you had to bring it up to 100 pounds a square foot, which is fine. That meant you're either putting new piers in underneath or you're going in and scabbing onto the existing joist. And either way, it's all below the floor finish, so you're not going to see it. All that is fine. You can see that they had to, the engineer recommended some of these piers be replaced. Um, that, that was some stuff that was not done to code. That was, that was done earlier. I guess the one thing that we need to talk about still, and we talked several times, but all this is interior sheathing, and what he had recommended is you come in with OSB or plywood and nail it to the frame, then you put your finished material on top of that again. And I think that's gonna cause a lot of problem. I think we're gonna lose a lot of the beaded board just taking it off, and you gotta pop the nails out, you gotta attach everything, and reattach it on top of the plywood. And I think to a large degree, it's already providing somewhat of a rigid frame with all that actual, it's actual, it's not nominal, it's actual three quarter inch lumber. And the plywood that's three quarters, only a little bit more in five eighths. I'm sure the plywood's stronger, but I mean, is it 80% or is it 90%? I don't know, but that's something that conversation to have with the engineer. And then that's the last one. And like I said, it's really not the end. Congratulations whenever you get to open it up, but you still got a lot of work to do and you got to make sure that everybody knows what you went through also and that, uh, that the organization has to continue. Thanks everybody. Good afternoon.